Our guest today is Dr. Benjamin Carson, Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. In addition to being awarded 60 honorary doctorate degrees, he is the author of five best-selling books, including his current New York Times bestseller, America the Beautiful. Dr. Carson is also a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Dr. Carson, I can't tell you how pleased I am to have you with us today on the Liberty Education Interview Series. Well, my pleasure to be here. Thank you. You know, in your book, you talk about the similarities between the U.S. and the historical empires that were in decline, namely an obsession with college and professional sports. Of course, they didn't have them in those days, but that's what we've got today. Uh, entertainment, a fixation with the lifestyles of the rich and famous, and a waning moral compass. And I might want to add to that list of electronic devices. <laughs> How do you get the attention of people who are addicted to bread and circus? Well, it's it's very difficult, and it requires good leadership uh, who can set out an agenda and set out a vision. You know, the Bible says, "Without a vision, the people perish." It's a it's a repeated pattern that we've seen historically, um, and when you don't have an identity and a real sense of who you are, then you start easily migrating into things that don't matter, and that's what's happening to us right now. You go out on the street and you find people, and you show them pictures. You might want to you show them a picture of, you know, the vice president that. Half of them might know, but if you show Kim Kardashian, probably ninety percent of them know. Right. You know uh, these kinds of things, and I, I'm not saying anything bad about Kim Kardashian. I'm just saying that the fact of the matter is, our focus is away from things that are important, and the reason that that's so important is because the founders of our nation emphasized the fact that our system of government was based upon a well-educated and informed populace that it could not survive if we turned to something else and that uh, we would fall easy prey to media and slick politicians and the nature of the country would completely change. Yeah, I think there's no question that the founding fathers, in fact, they called it an experiment because I think they had great concerns, particularly they had a great dislike for democracy, which is supposed to be different than a republic. Than a republic. But, yeah. Yes, but sticking with this subject, so many people compare what has happened to America over the past six years to the decline of other empires such as Rome, Spain, Great Britain, Greece, and so on. Well, particularly interesting, uh, if, if you look at a, a place like Rome, because they were so powerful, their military was so superior, there was no possibility that anyone would ever overcome them. And they destroyed themselves from within by their economic foolishness. Do you see anything, Doctor, unique about America that might give people hope that we can turn things around and avoid the same fate as these empires of the past? Well, I, I have been encouraged over the last few weeks you know, since the National Prayer Breakfast because I've had such an outpouring of support. It's overwhelming. And, uh, you know, particularly letters from elderly Americans who said they had given up and they were just waiting to die, and now they're reinvigorated again. You know, people are just so excited about the possibility of some common sense, and uh, that just seems to be such a rarity these days coming out of Washington, D.C. I do think that's why your speech struck a tremendous note. And speaking of elderly people, Health care is an issue that you're certainly well qualified to opine on, and we live in an age where the left has not only transformed people's desires into needs, but further transformed those needs into rights. What do you say to people, many of them conservative Republicans, quite frankly, who, for example, insist that a commodity such as health care is a right? Well, first of all, it's a discussion that doesn't even need to occur in this country because we already spend – more than $7,000 per capita per year on health care. The next closest country is about half that. So it's not that we haven't committed the resources to it uh, to give everybody superb health care. It's that we have so much inefficiency and corruption and replication in our system that no matter how much money we throw at it, we're never going to achieve satisfactory results. Also, one of the major pillars of our health care system 
are insurance companies that make money by denying people care. We have done the, the insurance companies a disservice by putting them in that role uh, because we've put them in a business role in dealing with people's health care. That's the wrong model. So, you know, we have to uh, relook at this thing. And that's the reason that, you know, I'm so excited about the, the concept of health savings accounts because 80% of the interactions that occur between the, the medical profession and patients are things that could be handled financially through an HSA. And only 20% would fall into the catastrophic or somewhere in between category where you would have to have bridge insurance plus catastrophic insurance. But that can be done at a much cheaper rate if we extract the administrative costs from those 80% of intercounters that normally occur. And so there are intelligent ways for us to do this, and we need to, to re-aim at wellness as opposed to sickness. And we can save a lot of money. You know, in the same vein, you stress the importance of education, but wouldn't everyone be better off if the government got completely out of the education business and allowed people to make their own choices for their children when it comes to education? Well, interestingly enough, you know, when, when Alexis de Tocqueville came here, uh, to study America because he was just so flabbergasted with how we were doing so well in such a short period of time. You know, he, he looked at some of our educational systems, and they were locally controlled systems. But he noticed that anybody finishing the second grade was completely literate. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, if your community didn't have appropriate educational facilities, you were fined. So it was it was really quite a serious issue, and people were so much better educated at that time than they are now. Um, so education is something that can very easily be handled on a state level. It doesn't really need to be handled on a national level by any stretch of the imagination. There are probably a whole lot of other things that can be handled that way, too. But the more and more bureaucracy that we stack up on everything that we do, the more costly it becomes. And eventually you reach a point where it's untenable. You simply cannot keep up with the escalating cost of gigantic bureaucracies. We haven't learned that lesson. But our founding fathers actually understood that, and that's the reason that they put the kind of Constitution into effect that they did because they knew that the natural tendency was for government to grow and for the rights of the people to shrink. I was, like so many other people, quite disturbed by calls from certain quarters for you to apologize after your brilliant remarks at the 61st Annual Prayer Breakfast. What is your response to someone like Cal Thomas, who's a longtime conservative columnist, who said he believes that you should apologize to Barack Obama for your remarks at that prayer breakfast? Well, he obviously got the memo. I, I, do, I never got the memo about us now being a monarchy in which you cannot uh, express your opinion. I didn't know. <laughs> which, by the way, I thought was one of your best lines. <laughs> so, you know, every, every, everybody falls victim to, you know, P, the PC police and, you know, the feeling that they need to, to go along to get along. But I don't feel that you need to go along to get along, particularly when going along means going further toward the cliff. And, you know, there comes a time when you simply have to speak up. And the fact of the matter is there wasn't anything that I said that wasn't true and that wasn't logical. And there's nothing that I said that should have been offensive to anyone who wasn't on the other side of what I'm saying. I agree 100%. It was all true, and I didn't see anything offensive except – the left seems to have a habit of thinking that anything that, that goes against their beliefs is somehow offensive, and that's why their their M.O. is indignation. They're constantly demanding apologies for everything. And exactly. It's, it's totally ridiculous. And, and they really need to stop for a moment and examine themselves and see how totally against any of the principles of freedom of speech and freedom of expression they are acting. And they always think that somebody else is doing it. But sometimes it's good to actually look at yourself in the mirror in an objective way. And some people have a very difficult time doing that. 
you're the doctor, but I think that the psychological term is projection, I believe. Exactly. <laughs> um, I thought your uh, comparing taxation to tithing, doctor, was really excellent. If, if you assume one believes that some form of taxation is morally valid, which, by the way, not everyone does, but right. that's another subject for another day, explain to our listeners your your idea sure. of fairness when it comes to a guy who theoretically makes $10 billion a year versus a guy who theoretically makes only $10 a year. Right. Well, I said, you know, a taxation system based on God's system of fairness, which was tithing. And, uh, you know, if you make a gazillion dollars, obviously you're going to owe a gazillion dollars. If you make very little, you're going to owe a very little. But everybody is contributing. So everybody feels that they have a stake in what's going on. Everybody has skin in the game. The the way we do it, um, you know, by excluding about half of the population, and saying, these guys over here, they're the bad ones. Let's tax them more. I want you to vote for me so I can tax them more. If you have any inkling of fairness, you can see that, that doesn't, that's not fair. When somebody who doesn't have any skin in the game can vote to tax more somebody who does have skin in the game, that that's the complete opposite of fairness but also if everybody has skin in the game and this is what some people are very very much afraid of if everybody has skin in the game it forces the government to be much more fiscally responsible because now when they start talking about raising taxes they have to justify it to everybody and that's much more difficult to do than to say, oh, don't you worry. I'm just raising it on this 1% or this 2% or this 5%. They need to give more anyway. You're okay. Right, because somehow it's just accepted that it's morally valid to tax people more because they make more. The more successful you are, the more you have to be punished. Uh, it's incredible and, what people have come to believe. And, and, if, and again, if they looked at it objectively, when you're talking proportionality, that's exactly what happens. If you make ten billion dollars, you put a billion dollars in the pot. That's a lot of money. If you make ten dollars, you put one dollar in the pot. That's not a lot of money, but it gives you just as many rights as the guy who put a billion in. I don't see anything that could be more fair than that. Well, and I think you made the point really graphically with those examples. I want to ask you one last question. Barack Obama has repeatedly made snide remarks over the years about Republicans believing that people should be quote unquote on their own. How would a President Carson get people to understand that their lives and actions should be their own responsibility rather than the government's and further that accepting responsibility for their own lives is far better for them and certainly their children and grandchildren than being dependent on government to take care of their needs? Well, first of all, you have to provide people with opportunities. And those opportunities are vanishing because of the restraining uh, policies. You know, there are a number of things that are keeping us from growing. You know, we have the highest corporate tax rates in the world. And then we criticize the corporations for taking their business overseas. We need to understand that in a capitalistic society, not in a socialist society, but in a capitalist society, the, the businesses are there to make money. They're not there to be social welfare organisms. However, when you understand that and you create an environment that allows them to flourish, they make more money. When they make more money and you have the right kind of tax system, that brings a lot more money into the government. That's one of the reasons that we were able to propel ourselves to the top so quickly because we understood that at one time. And, you know, we were not in the way with onerous regulations trying to control everybody. That is what you do when you have a system that is for, of, and by the government. But this is supposed to be a system that is for, of, and by the people. And we need to reemphasize what people can do. I would love to see people begin to emphasize uh, organizations like the Horatio Alger Society, where people are inducted about 10 or 12 each year who come from the bottom rungs of society and have made it to the top. Let's examine 
how they did that. You'll see a very common theme in all of those. And we need to put those in front of our young people rather than excuses and entitlement. Doctor, you're quite a man. I want to thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your fascinating insights with us. It has been absolutely my pleasure. Thank you.